Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And on our series regarding youthful aging, today we're going to be talking about habits, exercise, lifestyle changes, and diet for youthful aging. Now, I, there, we can use the word anti-aging, but you know, we're all going to age, but the key is to remain, remain youthful and healthy and vibrant. And number one is all about the attitude to have a healthy body. That attitude of maintaining health, maintaining a healthy mind, maintaining a good body mass index with having a body fat no greater than 24%. You know, the, it's the attitude about wanting to be healthy. So when we look at this, we see, number one, avoid smoking, drinking, and drug use. 28% or more, now we're not only talking Ill, illicit drugs, illegal drugs, not legal drugs, and that doesn't even take into that the whole gamut of people who walk in with their 5 to 12 medications and how much that shortens their life. But 28% or more people smoke, body fat no greater than 24%, only one-third or less of our population has a BMI, a body fat index, um, of less than 24%. And 24% is not lean. 13% is lean. But healthy, at least below 24%. Exercising 30 minutes a day, five days a week, only 10% of the population can put two and a half hours down as doing any form of exercise, whether it's walking the dog, out playing soccer with the kids. Only 10% of our population can attest that they do this. Eating a minimum of five, and I, they didn't even use organic, but five fruits and vegetables per day. Very few of uh, the population do this as well. We're lucky if we get one or two servings a day. But when we look for the habits for a long life, we want to avoid smoking and drinking and drug usage. We want to have the BMI preferably right about 19% or a little bit less. Nothing less than 13 would be better. Um, exercise 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week. and. Eat a minimum of five servings of fruits and vegetables per day. That really recommended would be at least six to ten servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Only 3% of our population meets these requirements. So I know my husband and I are in these 3% of the population. And by gosh, you know, it makes me a little angry that I'm going to have to take care of the rest of you all that don't try to work on your health. And it's breaking our country right now because we're having to pay so much money out for drugs and health care and diabetes and obesity because no one wants to take responsibility for their health. And by gosh, it's about time that we do that for ourselves and for our kids and teaching our kids and grandkids what it's like to have a healthy mind and body. So, you want to live a long, healthy life, pain-free, unless you're willing to do these types of things? No complaining. No complaining. If you want to do the donuts and Twinkies and all that wonderful stuff, you don't have a reason to complain. Now, if you're living a healthy lifestyle and something goes wrong, you can come and whine to me. I won't mind. When we're looking at exercise, we want to, once again, have a minimum of 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And the reason why, and here's the explanation of why it's, why it's important, and maybe nobody's kind of addressed this with you um, in the past. It slows the uh, um, aging process because it gives your body oxygenation. So the body's able to detoxify, transfer nutrients. When you oxygenate, your immune system gets stimulated. It helps you move the joints it helps you move the muscle tissues and stay, keep them strong. It raises endorphin levels. And when you raise endorphin levels, it helps with depression and pain. Boy, raising those endorphin levels to feel good all day for only doing 30 minutes a day of exercise, it'll outdo any Prozac any day if you just give it a try. Walking, biking, swimming, yoga, ward off, as I mentioned, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, 
diabetes, and so many multitudes of hundreds of different of ailments, and a variety of, of, of forms, whatever you choose, you need to move. Um, we got a stimulation of immune system function, as I mentioned earlier. It reduces the cortisol stress hormones. And when we reduce those stress hormones, which I call battery acid on every part of our body, guess what? The body can better handle everything and it repairs and progresses in a youthful aging process. Resistance training. Now, you know most of the um, reports out there say you can even build muscle into your 90s. So I have some of my 60-some-year-old ladies come in and say, ah, or my guys that are in their 70s, I can't build muscle. That's not what science says. Giving adequate nutrition and adequate good training, you can help build muscle. It helps your bones and your joints and your muscles stay strong. Um, now, when we're talking about exercise, I'm not just talking about exercise for the body. There's also exercise for the brain. And so that means keeping your brain active. Take a new dance class. Go to Alan Hancock and take some classes on welding or Spanish or whatever it is, computer science. Take those to stimulate new growth because we know from studies that when we stimulate those new skills, I'll be doggone if we don't stimulate our body's brain and keeping it young and warding off dementia. See, dementia occurs due to some physical issues that we'll talk about when we talk about supplements, but lack of activity, just the lack of activity. And I think there was an excellent video online about an older man who was in a wheelchair who was very, had a lot of dementia. And you can go on YouTube and look at this. And this man, when they started playing music from his era, he was singing songs. He could, when he was asked questions about who was playing it, he could answer those questions. He became a different individual. He had mental stimulation, so keep the mental stimulation going. Um, deep breathing exercises. Most people breathe very, very shallowly. And so what we try to do is think about taking a, a few deep breaths every few hours. I mean, obviously, you can take deep breaths and sigh when your kids come in and hand you a load full. But <laughs> if you can at work, just take a deep breath, hold it for 30 seconds, and let it out. It releases certain chemicals that help wake up the brain and get your breathing and your um, lungs expanded out. Breathing in combination with exercise, once again, increasing oxygenation. Learning how to relax. Now, obviously, we talked about stress hormones and cortisol, so we all need to learn how to relax. And I'm not talking about sitting down in front of the TV, folding your arms with your mocha in hand or your chips. I'm talking about learning how to relax in a healthy fashion. And obviously, that is doing activities that are enjoyable, learning how to maybe meditate. And meditation is probably one of the best things that I've ever done to help relax. And when you do it, I mean, just five or 10 minutes a day, it helps calm the mind down. Just sitting there in just pure silence, just trying to think of nothing, is a good meditation. Calm the mind, soothe your body. Do outside activities. Get out in the sun, fresh air. If your kids are out on their bikes, get out there. Go outside, do the gardening, mow the lawn. Get outside. You need the vitamin D. But that fresh air and that taking in, you know, having your eyes look at different things, your body motions and movements when you're outside. That's why walks are so beneficial. You know, a nice brisk one preferably with the dog is a great way to stimulate endorphins and get you moving. When we talk about... Sorry about that. Let me get this turned over here for you. The foods that tend to age you. So any women out there that don't want to have the wrinkly type of skin. Now, we're not talking about supplements at, in this particular topic, and I'm going to talk about that in our next uh, show. But the foods you want to avoid if you don't want to look old before your time and you don't want to age internally. Avoid excessive amounts of saturated fat. 
That means that big old burger from the fast food restaurant, the french fries that accompany it along with the soda. It isn't going to work. That's going to aid you tremendously by producing free radicals, messing with your blood sugars, clogging the arteries and veins. So avoid those types of saturated fats. And if you are going to eat the occasional beef, do the grass-fed beef. There's CLA, certain fats. The grass-fed beef is completely different. It was actually found not to increase the risk of arteriosclerosis by the federal government. Um, in addition, you'll do a better job by avoiding mad cow disease if you try to do uh, uh, grass-fed organic beef as well, too. There's been some recent scares uh, about that as well. Avoid all trans fats, artificial flavors, and colors. If you don't know what the ingredient is that you're reading on a container, and it's got more than five, six, seven ingredients, don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's going to potentially be damaging to your health, aging you very, 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 very quick. Avoid processed white flour, white sugar, excessive caffeine, soda, fast foods. All of them are detrimental to the health. If you want your caffeine, a little bit of coffee, I understand, but sitting there cranking the coffee or monsters or adrenaline types of drinks all day long is very aging. Um, the body ha produces more cortisol, stress hormones, adrenaline. It ages you very, very fast. There's ways you can metabolically speed yourself up. I mean, there's um, supplements that we can talk about uh, in our next segment that can help give you energy and feel youthful without causing you damage. And once again, avoid all food chemicals, dyes, pesticides, and herbicides. I think one of the key killers are the chemicals. And uh, I mean, when you've got a president appointing the head of the FDA that was uh, from a key um, officer for Monsanto, at this point it doesn't appear you're going to get any help from our government. But you've got to do the best you can to try to avoid those chemicals. Look for it. Try to do organic fruits and vegetables. Grow them in your own garden. Do the best you can to take in your health and your food into your own, own hands. I mean, there's so many good, good, um, you know, movies that you can watch, Forks and Knives, um, all those types of videos that you can look at and watch to learn about our food supply and what commercial farming and um, the lack of protection that the government gives us regarding our food supply. We really have to take and grab good, wholesome, organic fruits and vegetables, organic nuts, and bottom line, if we're going to eat meat, we better make sure that it's from a clean source. You know, wild Alaskan salmon, yummy, yummy. Um, you know, a little bit of tuna. I know I have a low mercury tuna, a tuna that's tested for mercury uh, in, in our stores. So avoiding these. When you want to have, in addition to the statements that it just made, when you want to have a youthful aging diet, you're going to look to eat five times a day, including fats, proteins, carbs, and fiber at each meal. I eat five servings minimum of organic raw fruits and vegetables with a variety of colors, lots of colors, to support every mechanism in your body. Eat berries regularly. They help you see at night. They help your health, your eyes, your immune system. Eat garlic and onions full of sulfur compounds. They help the immune system and heart health. Eat 15 to 25 grams of protein at each meal. You know, only 10% of our senior population gets adequate amounts of protein. Very sad. Without adequate protein, the immune system won't work right. The um, muscles start to deteriorate, and our poor seniors can't even carry their bodies around on their frail structures on that bowl of cereal that they have in the morning. And the wonderful canned soup they eat at lunch. We need to automatically consider our food. And just because you don't have anybody living with you, you've got to love and care for yourself and cook and take care of yourself. I mean, you can even make protein smoothies. Um, you know, a nice protein, a little bit of fruits, you know, throw in a handful of spinach, a half apple, and blend it up, and yummy. It's good. Um, consume at least eight glasses of water every two hours. Water cleanses the body, 
It helps the cells be able to transfer information. Oh my God, the, the list would go on and on. There's books written about what water can do for your health. Eat lots of greens. They oxygenate the blood. Eat whole grains like steel-cut oats, quinoa, brown rice, Ezekiel bread and tortillas, or whole grain breads from sunflower seeds or whole, whole rye kernels. Eat flourless breads, muffins, tortillas. That will, in turn, aid and assist you in keeping blood sugar stable and giving you the fiber that you need in order to eliminate property. Drink cleansing teas, green tea, dandelion, burdock, red clover, occasionally a cup of coffee, organic's okay as well. But these cleansing teas move the body along and they move with the body's natural processes instead of overstimulating the adrenal glands and overstimulating the body, period. These work with the body, not against the body. Eat organic cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, I know a lot of people don't like these, but they're probably the most anti-cancer foods from a standpoint of all the foods that we can eat. Include at least a serving a day somewhere in what you're eating. Eat fermented types of bacterial-rich foods. Sauerkraut, I know a lot of people go, ugh, but it's awful good on a Reuben sandwich, you know, and you can get turkey pastrami. And it's wonderful on Ezekiel bread with a little bit of veginase. Yummy. And like a lettuce and tomato and onion. You can eat healthy and it still tastes good. Eat at least a third a cup of nuts, seeds, avocados throughout the day. Those fatty acids are necessary in order to maintain all functions within the body and keep our hormones stable. This dieting diet right here is the key to you youthfully aging. Just these simple rules on two-thirds of a page of paper. Not a whole book. Very basic. Now I've typed out a sample diet and um, you can come at the vitamin and herb stores and you can pick one up if you want. But this um, diet gives you breakfast options, all of which are great for the blood sugars, good nutritionally, um, aid and assist healing. This is what is called a sample anti-aging, youthful aging menu that everybody should make out for themselves. And I mean, you don't have to use the exact things on here, but you can use something like this as a template. And there are a lot of books written on this as well, too. But what I've done here is take all the things that I know are healthy and try to give you one page, something succinct and simple, that you can base upon your diet, modifying things where you see fit. And I, I know a lot of my customers will come in and I get them on the proper supplements and we look at the diet, we review through it. What good, I mean, nutritional counseling is pretty key. Um, looking at, at good snacks, wholesome snacks, uh, mixed veggies, you know, you can do your chips, but make them whole grain with a little bit of guacamole. Do some trail mix, but, but make your own. With a little bit of coconut nuts, maybe a few raisins. You don't need the chocolate chips. The coconut and the nuts and a few raisins, almonds and sunflower seeds. You can make your own mix nice and, nice and healthy. You, you can eat well. I mean, if you picked fa a breakfast, a lunch and dinner, and two snacks, you would never be hungry from this diet and you would drop and maintain a healthy BMI. Anyway, I hope that helps. If you need a copy, you can stop by the vitamin herb stores and kind of discuss it with me or Ralph. Uh, next, we're gonna be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And I've got to make this kind of brief because of my time constraints of talking over. Um, this exercise I would like you to try in order to stretch out and elongate the joints to allow fluid to enter the joints. And it's just a matter of getting your arms parallel with the floor and reaching out and stretching. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to reach out as far as you can on both sides as if someone had um, a rope in your hand and they were pulling you. What this will do is it will pull the joints out and allow fluids to get into the joints 
It's extremely anti-arthritis and very easing on the joints. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Torciano. And Ralph. thank you for that intro. Mm -hmm. Well, add one more extremely beneficial effect to the spice oregano. Now, keep in mind, there's a couple of different types of oregano. There's obviously Mediterranean oregano and Spanish oregano. Mediterranean oregano tends to be higher in a constituent called carvacol. Well, the reason that's important is this. Carvacol, the, actual, the active constituent in oregano, which has been shown to be what they call antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, you name it, is now considered an anti-cancer agent when it comes to prostate cancer, or at least it's being studied for. This comes out of the Experimental Biology 2012 session, they basically this last April 24th. What they said is this, they are currently testing carbocol constituent of oregano on prostate cancer because it seems to induce apoptosis basically cancer cell suicide. They basically also said they're trying right now to determine how it does it so they could possibly mimic a drug, but for now the oregano seems to be doing a good job regardless. So we know that oregano possesses an antibacterial, as we discussed, as well as anti-inflammatory properties also. But its effects on cancer cells really elevate the spice to a level of a super spice like turmeric. Now imagine that if someone was taking turmeric and oregano for things like prostate cancer and the like. They said this is a huge potential in terms of using it as an anti-cancer agent. If the studies continue to, res to basically yield positive results, they say this super spice may represent a very promising therapy for basically patients with prostate cancer. Again, the study is published in the Experimental Biology 2012 session this April 24th. All right, now from something that works for prostate cancer to something which is commonly used, which does not work for prostate cancer. Now here it goes, at an article titled, Study Raises Doubt Over Treatment for Prostate Cancer. What they did is they looked at a study called the PIVOT trial, which is the largest randomized prostate study to date. It's called a Prostate Intervention Versus Observation Trial, henceforth PIVOT. They said this, the results show that prostate cancer surgery did not extend life. In fact, they also said too, this is their quotes, the study compared surgical removal of the prostate gland, radical prostatectomy, prostatectomy, if I can say that right, with watchful waiting and doing nothing. And they found out the surgery did nothing. The only rational response they say to these results is when presented with a patient with prostate cancer is literally to do nothing. In fact, the ones that had the prostate cancer surgery had a 3% reduction in life expectancy, which can be considered statistically insignificant or by chance. As the trials go on, they'll yield to say a prostate cancer surgery will actually knock you off faster than actually doing nothing at all. They also said some they said, in 50% of the cases, the cancer is so slow growing that patients affected, even left untreated, can live for many years and die totally as something else. So much so, a lot of the specialists or urologists are beginning to say, the question whether these, cancer, these cases qualify for the label cancer at all. This is their words, not mine. They also showed that those who underwent the surgery operation had less than 3% survival, I want to repeat that, and they basically said the one concern in making sure we don't progress forward with science is that many urologists spent years of training with these sort of complex surgical techniques to find the idea of watchful waiting totally unacceptable, meaning we're not really concerned about the health of the patient, we're more concerned about the training of the urologist, so please just stand by and conform yeah, I know this surgery is going to create lots of problems, but what am I going to do with all this training? You understand? They also said the surgery carries many side effects. Of one, impotence. 50% of the cases of people with prostate cancer surgery will be impotent. 10% will have incontinence the rest of their life. And there's some conflict with that saying that may be way underestimated. 
And the Euro Europeans, or the UK, where the pivot trial was done, said our surveillance is even better than what you guys got in the United States. So basically something to keep in mind, the fact that these guys are keeping track. They said these findings are from a large ongoing trial. We look forward to seeing the fully published results, which can help men in the future. Which is ironic since this study came out, you know, popular celebrity Dick Clark just recently died. The day before he died, he had prostate cancer surgery, something you don't really hear in the news that much. And chances are you're not going to find this on the news anytime shortly because it's against our belief, our conformity. All right. Now, again, another thing which is kind of anti-conformist only because the data represents something totally different than what the popular belief of the country is, is this. An article called, Evidence Shows That Antidepressants Likely to Do More Harm Than Good. This was published on the online journal of Frontiers in Psychology. They say it's important because millions of people have given antidepressants. But when they looked at antidepressants, even at their best, they compared poorly to the risk, which include premature death. Antidepressants, and I'm going to read the quote from this, since this is kind of controversial, I don't want to misrepresent anything. Antidepressants are designed to relieve symptoms of depression by increasing levels of serotonin in the brain where it, is regulates, where it regulates mood. And obviously in prior shows, we saw that serotonin doesn't play as much as depression as scientists used to think. The vast majority of serotonin the body produces though is used for other purposes, such as digestion, forming blood clots at wound sites, reproduction, and development. What the researchers found is that antidepressants have a negative health effect in all these processes, normally regulated by serotonin, developmental problems, problems in infants. Remember, they're giving antidepressants to mother for post, postpartum depression. Problems with sexual stimulation, sperm development in adults, digestive problems, diarrhea, constipation, indigestion, and bloating, abnormal bleeding, and stroke in the elderly. The authors reviewed three recent studies that showed that elderly antidepressant users are more likely to die than non-users. Have less than a minute? Yep. yep. All right. And basically, this is what we're looking at right now. So again, before anybody takes an antidepressant, seriously, talk to a psychologist or someone's experienced in psychology before you take this route. My time is up. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Ralph. Once again, do your research. Um, all these things are um, you can confirm by going to the Internet and looking it up. Thank you for joining our show. Have a great day.